Hello, and welcome to Behind the Horror. Scary movie fans, such as myself, will hear that a movie is based on a true story. A few of them we already know, but most, well, we never go on to find out just what that true story is. So, in this series, we will explore and find out exactly what the true story is behind the movies we love. The 1974 movie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, starts us off with what appears to be a grotesque opening scene, as an anchorman can be heard announcing breaking news of a macabre artistic display of decomposing bodies left out in the elements. The anchorman also says many crypts have been taken. The anchorman also says many crypts have been broken into, tombs robbed. He reports that the locals have gone to the cemetery where the Crips had been robbed to see if their family members' tombs had been touched. We see what appears to be two decomposing bodies propped up on a gravestone, one dead body holding the other. We also hear on the news that there have been incidents at a Texas oil refinery at the line of Texas and Louisiana, where people were injured and that there has been an outbreak of cholera in California. We see heavily edited videos of what appears to be fires as the newsman speaks about a young man committing suicide by jumping off of the roof of a building. We are to take from this that the world is indeed a dark place. We then see a dead and upside down armadillo laying on the road as a group of young adults exit a green van that has pulled over to the side of the road. One of them is in a wheelchair and he is assisted out of the van so that he can relieve himself. A semi goes barreling down the highway very close to the van, which sends the man in the wheelchair rolling down the ditch. Once he is retrieved, they continue on their way. They enter into the outskirts of a town where it appears many people are hanging out in a cemetery. A young woman from that van asks to be taken to her grandfather's grave. Some random guy who appears to be heavily intoxicated begins to ramble on about quote seeing things and chuckling to himself while holding a beer bottle. Once the young girl is satisfied that her grandfather's grave was left undisturbed, they continue on in the van and pass a rather pungent slaughterhouse, a meat processing plant if you will. The group goes on and they see a hitchhiker on the side of the road, so they decide to pull over and pick him up. The man states that he had been at that slaughterhouse and you can tell that the group is immediately put off by this guy that they can tell he's off. He shows the young man in the wheelchair pictures of his work where he uses a sledgehammer to kill the cattle rather than an air gun. As he describes how he processes the cow's head and contents there within, the others act disgusted. The man then takes a pocket knife from one of the other passengers and begins to cut open his own hand, making a huge awkward smile the whole time, then gives the pocket knife back to the owner. He then sort of awkwardly takes this camera from around his neck and he takes pictures of the other passengers, then asking them for $2 for each picture. He then invited them to come to his home for dinner with him and his family. He then grabs a straight razor out of his boot and cuts the man in the wheelchair's arm really badly. They promptly kick him out of the van. The driver exclaims rather loudly that this will be the last time that he ever picks up a hitchhiker, which in our experience in true crime is a very good decision. So after driving for a while, they pull off at a gas station and the two girls exit to go inside. 
The guys that are still at the van begin asking the attendant about the old Franklin place, quote unquote. The attendant invites them to stay there to wait for a fuel delivery since he said he was out and to enjoy the barbecue. They all decide to leave and take their chances on finding another gas station and one of the girls notices the quote crazy man had smeared blood on the side of their van. They finally arrive at an old house that clearly mother nature is reclaiming. They begin exploring inside the large place. A couple wander off outside looking for the swimming hole, wink wink, and discover a neighboring building that they believe will have fuel. As they look around the property to find someone to ask about it, they walk up to the front porch of a house. The young man, after attempting to knock on the front door, looks down and finds a human tooth. He then knocks again and the door sort of opens, so he shouts hello as he goes inside. He hears what sounds like a pig squealing. And as he goes in to investigate, a man suddenly appears with a strange mask and he hits him in the head with a sledgehammer. His body drops to the floor, twitching from nerves as he dies. And the man with the mask slams a door shut with the young man's body inside the next room. What happens next? Well, those of us who have seen the movie know, and the rest, if you're a horror movie fan, this should be a staple. You should definitely see it. I mean, it's 1974, but it's still a classic. Now, as most of you probably know, some might not, this movie is loosely, and I stress the loosely, based on Ed Gein. So, who was he? Ed Gein was known as the, quote, butcher of Plainfield, and he was diagnosed with chronic schizophrenia, psychosis. He was considered a sexual psychopath and a necrophiliac. So let's get into his story. Edward Theodore Gein was born in La Crosse County, Wisconsin on August 27, 1906. His parents were George and Augusta, and he had one older brother named Henry. Ed's father was known to be an alcoholic, and his mother despised her husband because of it. George couldn't seem to keep a steady job, and when Ed was a little boy, the family had to sell the grocery store that Augusta actually owned, and they went and bought the farm in Plainfield, Wisconsin. But you see, Augusta chose this remote farm on purpose to distance herself and her sons from the society that she saw as wicked and sinful. Ed was never away from the farm other than to go to school. Augusta was extremely religious and her preaching at her boys about how evil the world had become was nonstop. She told her sons that all women were whores, save her. She read violent passages from the Old Testament in the Bible to her sons every single day. George himself had little to do with the boys' upbringing. Augusta had complete control. But he did beat them excessively as a form of discipline. George did hold odd jobs here and there, but could never really retain employment for any length of time. Now, in school, Ed was very shy and withdrawn. He would also sort of burst out into laughter randomly during class. To his peers, he seemed a bit feminine, which fueled the local bullies. He had a bit of a lazy eye, and he was teased relentlessly for that as well. It is said that he also had a lesion on his tongue that made his speech a bit different. Despite this, Gein indeed tried to make friends, but when Augusta inevitably found out, she scolded him heavily. He was described as socially awkward and immature, but he did do well in class. <laughs> 
So in 1913, when Ed Gein was only seven years old, he involuntarily ejaculated while watching his parents slaughter a pig on their farm for food. Of course, this would have been an anxious and embarrassing moment for him. Another childhood incident happened when his father beat him in the head so severely that his ears began to ring. You see, he had received this beating because he had come home crying as a reaction to the bullying that he was enduring at school. When he was 12, his mother caught him masturbating while in the bathtub. She shoved her hand into the water and sort of aggressively grabbed his genitals, exclaiming that they were, quote, the curse of man. In 1920, Ed graduated from the eighth grade and then promptly dropped out. But it is important to know that back then, that was pretty common because most kids were needed to work the farm. So in essence, Augusta was very critical of her boys, believing wholeheartedly that they would turn out to be failures, just like their father, and she was sure to remind them of that. She made both of her sons promise to remain virgins. And folks, that was Ed's childhood. So let's unpack that. A study out of Penn State said that Ed had a textbook serial killer upbringing, but I want to personally add that his was one of the few textbook scenarios, okay? Ed did have a typical distant alcoholic father and the radically religious mother who perpetually preached at her sons about the sins of man. She demanded complete loyalty to her and both of her boys were not really even allowed to have any friends. But creating social relationships is central to a person's well-being. Learning the joy of friendships and societal rules, which are vastly important. Experiencing social behavior and engaging in social interaction outside of your own family is vital for healthy child development. The absence of this has been shown to affect child development in various ways. Socially isolated children tend to have lower educational success, generally are in the group of less advantaged social classes in adulthood and are much more likely to be psychologically distressed. So a quote from noisolation.com states, quote, the primary function of the human stress response is to protect the body from the environment. When a person is socially isolated, as it is a basic human need, the body will perceive the situation as a threat. During the time of the active stress response, the brain will release multiple stress hormones to protect the body from danger. The release of these hormones is needed for the person to react toward the current stress factor and resist the possible harm. However, the body cannot release these stress hormones and protect the body from stressful situations for an unlimited time. Having an active stress response over an extended period has been proven to increase the risk of developing cardiovascular disease elevated blood pressure, infectious illness, cognitive deterioration, and mortality. These are physiological consequences of being prone to stress over time, and they are typically experienced in adulthood. High levels of stress are therefore regarded as a threat to a socially isolated child's health, not only in their early years of life, but also in adulthood. Unquote. Now, studies of social isolation have shown that Ed's level of isolation negatively impacts the development of the brain's structures. There is a deficit in the communication chains in a certain type of cells. These cells had impaired neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication in the prefrontal cortex. Guys, the prefrontal cortex. Now, if you've been with me for any amount of time or are familiar with the different regions of the brain and how they work, you will know that any damage or deficit to the prefrontal cortex is going to be a bad time. 
It's the part of the brain that's associated with a variety of cognitive functions, such as planning complex cognitive behavior, higher thought processes, moderating social behavior, decision-making, and so on. Now, it's mentioned that Ed's father did beat him and hit him in the head so severely that it made his ears ring. This was most likely trauma-induced tinnitus. After sustaining a mild traumatic brain injury, most of the brain's energy is diverted to basic functioning and little is left over for filtering or censoring. Trivial or insignificant thoughts may often have the same weight in the person's mind as important ones, which can make making decisions more difficult. People may find that their mind gets stuck on an idea or phrase that keeps replaying and this uses a great deal of brain energy. And then we have Augusta's religious beliefs spilling over into socially isolating her sons, shoving scripture down their throats nonstop and her even grabbing her own son's genitalia aggressively and stating that it was the sin of man. Science has found a link between mania and, quote, hyper-religiosity. Now, while you guys know I don't hold a PhD, some of Augusta's behavior seem to at least match the criteria for the hyper-religiosity. It is a psychiatric disturbance in which a person experiences intense religious beliefs that interfere with normal functioning, such as work and social functioning. But basically what we have here is a boy who was moved onto a very remote farm, taught that anyone outside of his own mother was basically unacceptable, bullied by other kids at school for being socially underdeveloped, not super masculine, and possibly had a slight speech impediment. He had hellfire and brimstone preached to him constantly, and when he was in the bathtub doing what is perfectly normal for a pubescent boy, his mother reached into the water and grabbed his most private area, squeezing and telling him that it was the curse of man. Augusta brought her sons up to hear how worthless men were while their father drank heavily and physically abused them. And yet, as we will learn rather quickly, Ed absolutely worshiped his mother. He saw her as the most angelic figure. So let's get back into it. For the rest of Ed and his older brother Henry's young adult years, they avoided anyone outside of their household, basically just to appease their mother, and had only each other for friendship. In 1940, Ed Gein's father died from heart failure, brought on most likely by his alcoholism. Ed was 34 years old at this point. Augusta promptly told the boys that their father was burning in hell. So Ed and Henry went into town. They took on odd jobs. Now Ed and Henry took on odd jobs around the really small town that they lived near for extra money. And thus they were forced to actually socially interact. Oddly enough, parents asked Ed to babysit their children, which he was happy to do. He found that he got along with kids very well. He and his brother Henry were considered very trustworthy and well-liked in town. Now in 1942, Ed had to travel to Milwaukee to get a military draft physical. He failed only due to his lazy eye and was returned home to the farm. This trip both excited and terrified him as this would be the furthest Ed Gein would ever be from home. It was around this time when Henry, Ed's brother, started kind of scandalously dating the single mother of two from town. Henry also began to make critical remarks about their mother's utter control over them. Henry expressed concerns about Ed's attachment to their mother as well and spoke with Ed on occasion about it, which upset Ed very much. So in the spring of 1944, Ed and Henry were doing the necessary chores around the farm, burning off some brush on the property, only the fire got out of control. 
The fire department saw the smoke from a distance and they came quickly to assist. Once the fire was out, Ed stated his brother was missing. They began searching for Henry, but curiously, Ed was able to lead them straight to his body. His body was located lying face down with no visual burns on the body, and later the medical examiner stated Henry did have some bruising on his head. Though it was suspicious, the police did not believe there had been any foul play and that he had simply died from smoke inhalation. At this point, the now 38-year-old Ed and Augusta were the only ones living in the home. However, not long after Henry's death, Augusta had her first stroke and did have to be hospitalized. Once she was able to return home, she noticed Ed was reading books about human anatomy and grave robbing and how to shrink heads. This concerned her, of course, and she let him know under no certain terms that those reading materials were completely unacceptable. Then within the next year, Augusta died. Ed was completely beside himself, utterly devastated. Augusta was quite literally the only friend that he felt he had ever had. To him, she was his one true love. He now felt completely alone. He boarded up the rooms that she had frequented, leaving them completely untouched. He only really utilized one small room off of the kitchen and then the kitchen itself. Ed then attempted to support himself by continuing to do handiwork for the townspeople. It didn't really take very long for Ed to start really living in squalor, and he also began reading violent and graphically depicted comic books. He became quite interested in crime magazines that talked about cannibalism and the Nazi death camps, which was still very raw in people's minds at this time. The people of Plainsfield noticed his appearance was becoming more unkempt. They stated the smell emanating from him was bad. Two years after losing the last of his family, Gein was intensely lonely. He began to hallucinate, which scared him, so he started going to visit his mother's grave late at night. The more he visited, the less he wanted to leave. He just really didn't want to go back home to an empty house by himself. So one night he visited his mother's grave. He dug down and opened the casket and twisted her head off to be able to take it home to try to shrink it as he had read in those books. After that, he began visiting many cemeteries in a quote, dazed state, sometimes doing nothing other times digging up fresh corpses of middle-aged women that reminded him of his mother that he had read about in the obituaries. Once Ed got these bodies home, he would pleasure himself over them. He later claimed he never attempted sex with the bodies due to the odor, but he did remove the breasts, the nipples, genital area and other body parts which still put him under the classification of necrophilia. There was also an increase in missing people in the area at that time but police could never link them to Ed, though they did begin to suspect. Now the very controversial part of this is that Ed had decided that he wanted to be a woman but gender reassignment was just not something that they could do back then. There was just no real feasible way to do it. So he skinned the bodies of the dead women he dug up. He processed the skin for softness and preservation. He began making himself a woman suit. He would put the skin suit on late at night and walk around the farm pretending to be a woman under the moonlight. In 1951, 45-year-old Ed went into a nearby pub owned by a woman named Mary Hogan. Mary reminded Ed of his mother, and yet Mary was very well known for her foul mouth and wild living, which Ed's mother would not have tolerated on any level. But Ed was transfixed. <laughs> 
three years later, Mary Hogan disappeared from her pub. Police found a pool of blood on the floor and an empty bullet shell. Of course, this became the talk of the town, and Ed would tell people, quote, she's not missing, she's hung up at my house, unquote. People chuckled, you know, they dismissed him, oh, it's just Ed being Ed, because Ed was a good man, if only a bit of an oddball. In just three short years, they would not be dismissing Ed as just a harmless oddball any longer. In 1957, Ed Gein walked into a store called Warden's, run by Bernice Warden, to ask her and her son about the price of antifreeze. As most of us are well aware, winters in Wisconsin can be quite harsh. Now on this particular day, most of the men folk were out hunting. So the next day, it was noticed that the Warden's store was locked and that the company truck was gone. The police came, they entered the store to find Bernice was not there. They did, however, find blood on the floor. Bernice's son looked and the last receipt written was for antifreeze for Ed Gein. So now the police knew exactly where to start their search and they began making their way to Ed's farm. But nothing could quite possibly prepare them for what they were about to find. The sheriff entered Ed Gein's house through what they used to call the summer kitchen, which is sort of like a shed built onto the house. There was no electricity on the property, so of course the room was dark. The sheriff's shoulder bumped into something hanging from the ceiling. When he turned his flashlight around to see what it was, to his horror, he realized it was a human woman who had been hung upside down and dressed like a deer, gutted, cleaned, and decapitated. She had been slit from her bottom between her legs and up her abdomen to her chest. The sheriff and his backup entered the rest of the house only to find the house was not really in a livable condition. Ed was indeed living in complete filth. They also found a treasure trove of the most macabre collection of different body parts in different stages of dismemberment and preparation or being used as tools. So here is a list of what they found. Four noses, human bones and fragments, nine masks of human skin, bowls made from human skulls, 10 female heads with the tops sawed off, human skin covering several chair seats, Mary Hogan's head in a paper bag, Bernice Warden's head in a burlap sack, nine outer female genitalia in a shoebox, skulls on his bedposts, organs in the refrigerator, a pair of lips on a drawstring for a window shade, a belt made from human female nipples, and a lampshade made from the skin of a human face. So after Ed Gein was arrested, he admitted to shooting and killing bar owner Mary Hogan. During the questioning, the sheriff became so upset that he slammed Ed's head and face into the wall, thus making Ed's confession completely inadmissible. I mean, really, the sheriff had become so utterly traumatized that it affected his health from then on. As a matter of fact, he died from a heart attack even before the trial began. Many stated Gein killed him just as if he had laid hands on him. In 1957, during the trial, Gein pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and was taken to Central State Hospital for the criminally insane to be observed and evaluated until he was found mentally fit to stand trial. Ed was found fit enough to stand trial in 1968 when he was 62 years old. So in 1958, the Gein house burned down by undetermined means. 
Most say someone burned it down to stop the flow of curious looky-loos driving through their little town to look for the house of horrors. When Ed found out, he said, quote, just as well, unquote. His car was then auctioned off for $760, which is about the equivalent of just under $6,000 today, to a carnival sideshow. Ed had used that car to haul the dead corpses from the cemeteries to his home. The people that worked in the asylum that Ed had resided in said he was a model patient, polite, courteous, and he kept to himself. The other inmates reported that sometimes during a full moon, he would look as though he were in a trance and would be mumbling to himself. Ed Gein died of respiratory failure in 1984 at 78 years old, and he was buried next to his mother. Thanks for listening.